All right. Oh my God, it's, it's so huge. <laughs> Anyways, you can read that stuff pretty good. I'm just gonna tell you that Ray is a, a coach uh, that coaches at many places. He, and, and you know, high schools, it's tough to find a good golf coach and keep a good golf ball coach. And so in the Rochester area, where I'm born, uh, Rochester John Marshall, he coaches that, right? The Rockets, he's got that on here. And over here is kind of his meat potato place. That's the Rochester Century. And, and Ray has had uh, multiple state champion girls, a phenomenal record holder. I don't even know what was. And um, he's got a great uh, boy right now that's jumping on 15 6, 16 6. And I had the pleasure to see him do it this summer. Um, in a summer meet, he jumped real well. So he's got good coaching. Um, background, he, he, he keeps doing something right. You don't have success over and over again if you're not doing something right. So I um, really, I, I kind of seek him out. He's in my conference mm -hmm. to come and, and, and talk because I want to hear what he says. I want to hear what he says. So here he is, Ray Ashley. Hey, man. So just a little bit about the approach that I'm gonna take is, is I started from nothing. I was a 14 foot vaulter in high school, so I thought I knew it all. I learned very quickly that I didn't know much at all. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit about my experience and some of the lessons learned. And um, so I hope, it, I hope it enlightens you a little bit. Um, if you find that something that I cover very quickly, and you want to know a little bit more about my thoughts around that particular topic, you can seek me out afterwards and I'll fill you in or just butt in and force me to talk in more detail. I uh, wanted to start out with this slide here. So this is, uh, I hate indoor training. I want to be on the runway in the pit day one. And it sucks that we can't be, but I put this picture up because we vaulted this day on day one. Kids got out with their shovels, cleaned everything up, we got the pits out, and we were vaulting. It wasn't pretty, but it was a lot of fun. So, uh, I got into pole coaching uh, because I vaulted in high school, um, and I had an interest in trying to get my son to do it. Uh, even as a, my son was a hockey player, um, and he was wicked fast on the ice. Even as a youngster, he was wicked fast. So I thought, man, if I can take that speed and put it on the runway, I'm sure I can tell him what I knew, which was two things. Run as fast as you can, and pretend that you're gonna splat your chest against a brick wall. That's how I learned how to pole vault. So it wasn't pretty. And I can tell you, I went in a lot of places that back in the 80s, safety, there was no such thing as safety. It was just crazy dangerous. Uh, I did make two trips to state, and I no headed my first time, and I think I made opening height my second time. I could not get used to those damn buns. I jumped on pits that were, you know, made out of old furniture, right? And I got to state, now I have this giant porta pit. I could not handle those buns. Just couldn't do it. Um, I wanted to coach my son. And then I needed a distraction from work. I'm a software engineer, um, and I'm writing code a lot. And my brain's all messed up after a day's worth of trying to solve problems, and so this was a nice way to get away from that. Who do I coach? I coach boys, girls, seventh through 12th grade, Rochester John Marshall, and Rochester Century. I also coach Rochester Lourdes, and the way that I do that is through a community education program so they can come up to Century and train with me. All my athletes come to Century and train at Century. Um, last season, I did make a few trips. I've been coaching John Marshall for five years now. And last year was the first year I went over to John Marshall to try and get some new blood worked into the system from John Marshall. And it didn't really get anybody new, but we tried. Uh, I put this picture up here because I think it's kind of cool. I hope you can all see this. So this is, uh, this is me in 1982, jumping 13 feet. 
And this is my son in 2014 as a senior jumping 13 feet in Austin. It's a cool jump because if you look at his hips to his hand position ratio, that's, that's a pretty, pretty decent jump above your top handhold. And he had a really pretty turn. Probably one of the best that came out of Century for how he turned. So, <clears throat> uh, I do have, because I'm near Mayo Clinic, we get some interns that come in from colleges. Um, I had a woman from Murray State that came in and she showed up on the runway and said, hey, I heard that you can help me out. And I said, yeah, I sure can, but you have to talk to your coach first, get his coaching points and make sure that I'm teaching you what he, want, he or she wants you to learn. I'm not gonna teach you what I do if it's vastly different. Uh, funny story about her, she got on the runway, she started doing a run throughs, things were looking good. She wanted to work on trying to get herself more vertical because I, I like to think that that's one of my specialties is getting kids vertical. And she was looking good, looking good, looking good. She's running through. All of a sudden, and you've probably all experienced this, she can't jump anymore. She'd run up, <laughs> let go of the pole, and run into the pit. And I'm thinking, uh, you got a bigger problem here <laughs> than not being able to get vertical, right? And she goes, yeah, I know. I just can't seem to get over this. So that was weird. She, <laughs> she, did, she did get to the point where she made some improvements with her vertical, but that was, that was tough to watch her just not be able to jump. Okay, so here's some of my athletes' accomplishments. Um, I'm gonna try to get through this uh, as quickly as I can, but there's some, some important points that I do really wanna point out. At the top here, this is Hayden Ashworth, my son. Um, he started at Plainview Elgin Millville, and I literally just kinda helped a little bit on the side, I said, hey, that looked good, that looked bad, that kind of stuff. Funny story, as a seventh grader, he did call me from the ER one night. He said, hey, Dad, I'm in the ER. I said, what'd you do? He said, well, I hooked the crossbar and it hit me in the mouth and I bit my tongue. I was like, well, that's awesome, right? <laughs> totally awesome. <laughs> um, so he, Hayden would transfer into the Rochester School System for hockey. And so that uh, spring of 2010, when he started there, I just showed up at the high school and asked if I could help out. And you all know how that goes when somebody shows up and says, can I help? You're gonna put them to work pretty quickly. Um, as an eighth grader, this is where Hayden and I would meet John Pollock, who it's very fitting that he happened to speak before me. Um, John Pollock and I are very good friends. We've been working together for this entire chart since the first day I met him. Um, he's been a integral part of my learning and my ability to produce these kinds of athletes. Um, when I did start at Century, Coach Isla was a coach at the time, and he was coaching a girl by the name of Jess Chrissy. I did not, I, I left those two alone to do their thing. Um, but when that season ended, he said, you got this, I'm out of here. And he walked away and never showed up again. <laughs> so, but he was great. We had a great relationship. He worked with Jess and the girls and I did what I could for the boys to kind of help them get along. Um, Ariel Hayward was one of the first very athletic females that I got to work with. She went to state, I went to state with her and she no heighted. And that was my first trip to state and I can tell you I was so uncomfortable, I was so embarrassed, I was so I just, I was like, holy cow, am I in the wrong place, right? It was terrible. But when I walked away from that, I said, no athlete of mine is ever gonna know height again, ever. And I said, what do, to myself, I'm saying, what do I have to do to ensure that that never happens again, right? I had to get training. I had to dig in. Um, and Ariel would go to, back to state the next year and she would get fifth place at state the next year. So we definitely corrected that. Uh, Andy Jacobs, she was our four-time four -time state champion. When she was a freshman um, and set the state record at 13 feet, I knew I was in trouble. I really did. I really knew th this was the point in time when I said, 
I'm going to have to become a student, and I'm going to have to find some people that can make me a better coach. Uh, because my athletes were starting to do, outdo my ability to think. And that was very uncomfortable for me. Um, so I sort of hit the road, as you might say, and, and found some good people. Again, John Pollock got involved. He put me on the right track and, uh, and came down to Rochester a few times and, and really, really made a difference to help move me forward. Um, Michael Atkins was the first male that broke the century school record. That was a 14-6 jump. And William Kolb, he actually broke it before Michael Atkins. Those two were uh, some of the most comical pole vaulters you could ever experience working with. Um, and they argued and they fought and they challenged each other, but um, hard to coach because they didn't really want to listen. They really didn't want to listen. They just wanted to goof off, bend the poles, and fly over the crossbars. Uh, William Kolb, one time, he came up to me, and we were at, we were at Mankato West. It's a good name. Yeah, good name. Uh, <laughs> he comes to me, he says, Coach, first jump, 7-6 front flip. Uh, I don't know if you remember that day, but I was like, oh, God. I couldn't say no, because he, he would do it anyway. So sure enough, he comes in 7-6, and he's a 14-foot jumper at this time, yeah. bends the pole and throws a front flip. And I said, all right, you're done with that. But that's the kind of goofy kid he was. That's a pole vaulter. <laughs> no fear whatsoever. I think if you were at Matt's talk earlier, he talked about, you know, you got to be a little bit crazy about jumping off buildings and things like that. So... He was like that. He scared the crap out of me with the things he would do. I mean, he'd, he'd pick up a pole. Uh, he'd do like a two-pole jump from a 14-foot pole to a 15-foot pole and grab right at the top and take off. And I would just stand there like this. <laughs> and he'd somehow end in the pit. He was very good about knowing where he was, though, which is, I think, very hard for pole vaulters, knowing where you are. And he knew exactly where he was all the time. So if he had to bail, he knew how to bail and he, might, and he always landed fairly well. Uh, so, Jenna, I want to mention Jenna Myro. She was, uh, when she was a senior, she was a jumper that jumped like nine feet, like three, two years in a row, nine feet, nine feet, nine feet. And she would just get so frustrated because she could not break that nine foot mark. At, um, her senior year at Big Nine Championship, she jumped 10-3, and she came out of the pit bawling. And, I'm, and she wasn't done yet. <laughs> I was like, you can't cry yet. This is not the time to cry, because you know, that's gonna take some energy out of her. But um, she didn't make 10-6, but she was super excited about being able to pull that off. Um, I also went and uh, got my level one certification with USATF so that I could coach beyond high school which got me into the USATF Junior Olympics. Um, quick story here about my first trip for the uh, Junior Olympic National Championship. John and I and Andy's family <laughs> took a fun trip down to Houston, Texas. And in that drive, you know, we, got, we all got pretty close, pretty good little family of pole vaulters. And um, driving down there, I was using GPS and I just wasn't making turns fast enough to keep up with the GPS. And so everybody's asleep except for me. I go into this parking lot to get turned around and everybody wakes up and they're wondering what we're doing in Home Depot parking lot in Tennessee. <laughs> so we got off course and uh, yeah, they, they seem to talk about that a lot. Um, so John and I co-coached that meet. John kind of took the lead and I stood behind him going, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was really fun. Um, Andy would go back to the Junior Olympics again and she would win it in Florida. I did not get to go because I had other things going on, but I wish I could have been there. Uh, 2017, Nick Sonobin was the first John Marshall kid to come onto the scene. And then he stayed with me for the rest of his career. And then along came Nathan Nelson, 
He's the he's the 15 six jumper right now. That's an indoor jump, which is very exciting to to know coming into our next outdoor season. Uh, Julia, Julia, she was from Rochester Lourdes. She straight pulled nine six more than one time, but it frustrated the crap out of her that she could not make a 10 foot jump. And I can tell you. A 9.6 jump on a straight pole is a pretty darn good jump, right? And I just told her, I said, you're, not, you're gonna be at 9.6 forever because your grip and your body language just is not gonna improve. You have to learn how to bend a pole. You absolutely have to learn how to bend a pole. So I took her in over two seasons and put her on really small poles and forced her to bend a pole. And the way that I did that was I actually intentionally made her block with her left arm so she would run in like this with both arms as stiff as possible and then she would just bend it. The pole's got to bend if you're, if you're a little bit heavier than the pole. It's going to have to give. And so I had her hit that just over and over and over and over. And when she'd go back to meets, she still had to go back to her big pole and still had the stiff pole. However, at the end of her senior year, she would figure out the bending thing the day before state. Goes to state and gets a new PR at 10 feet. So that was, that was and she was bending the pole that she had been straight pulling for two straight years, which was really cool. One of my biggest disappointments was COVID because Riley Lee was a senior at that time and he would have been up in the 14s for sure his senior year, which was a, a big bummer. Uh, Nathan Nelson, last year, his 15 foot jump would now put him at the top of um, Rochester, the city record for Rochester across all schools. He would now hold that along with the Century High School uh, record, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, Ariel Hayward, she ended up going to USC on a pretty big scholarship. Andy Jacobs went to Nebraska on a pretty big scholarship. Jenna Myro, um, she ended up going to UW Stout. And uh, Nathan Nelson has already signed with UW Madison. So I, I hope that what I give to these colleges is something that they can work with. So, and with that, a few, I really do gotta point out a few thank yous because you can't do this stuff alone. I mean, you just cannot. There's gotta be people that help you uh, do stuff with your program. And the biggest thing is I, I don't see my wife. So the biggest thank you right now is to say thank you to my wife. She's over here. She rarely sees me in the springtime. I, I do spend anywhere from two to six hours a night on the runway with my kids. I can have up to 20 kids on the runway and that's a lot of kids. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the number of kids later on. I've been fortunate uh, with my athletic directors. These guys have been fantastic with everything that I asked for, and they've given me just about everything I've uh, put down for them. I've had fantastic parents. I've heard some horror stories about different parents that get, get in and try to poke at the at the polo coaches to kind of tell them what they're doing wrong or might try to help them or might take credit for how good their kid is or whatever. I've heard some horror stories, but I've had fantastic parents. My head coaches have always been fantastic, great support. Um, it does get a little frustrating when kids get pulled all over the place and some of the young kids can't wrap their head around leaving one event to go to the next event and then, oh my God, I'm gonna piss off the head coach. I gotta be over here and coach, what do I do, what do I do? And that can be tough to manage as an assistant coach when you're off on the side and, and there's a lot of activity going on. Young kids struggle with that a little bit. Uh, coaches and clubs, Steve White, I'll talk a little bit about him later. Big, big, big uh, addition to my ability to pick poles. Really, really big effect there. Uh, Carl Vesselman, he's one of my folks that I borrow poles from. He had an athlete named Lexi that competed against Andy, and those two were neck and neck at every meet when uh, Lexi was a senior. Always fun to watch. Him and I got along really well. Uh, Charles from Byron, um, 
we lend each other poles back and forth all the time. Matt Olson is the uh, male coach. He and I collaborate a lot on things that he likes to do a certain way, things that I like to do a certain way. And then we try to pick on each other about which way might work better. Or sometimes we find something that helps the other one more so, or we see something at a meet. It's like, hey, did you think about this? So we get along pretty good in that regard. All of my athletes I send to Flagle Athletics if they want to do off-season training. Um, working with John Pollock, I ended up meeting Matt and Esther uh, Flagel uh, through John, pretty much. Uh, we all jumped at um, July 4th Lacrosse River Vault when I was 54 years old. I made 10 6. Woohoo! It was a crazy day. I started at 8 feet, I made every height on the third attempt at 98 <laughs> degrees. He was a huffing and a puffing. Yeah. <laughs> but I got to ring the bell every time I PR. So every jump was a PR, so I rang the bell. <laughs> Um, and I put the last one on chart, uh, I put John Pollock there. Uh, like I said, John and I go way back to Hayden being a eighth grader and we have had fun. We have spent time together. We, it's, it's just a 10 year relationship that I can't say enough about. And, um, and I'll say something specific about what it means, what his impact was on this screen. I realize you can't see this. There's a lot of talking points here. I do want to get through them. Quickly, how am I doing on time? Six minutes. Okay, all right. All right, so, uh, too many kids, right? Two schools, boys and girls, seventh through 12th grade. I have found a way to make that work, believe it or not. So I've divided up basically on skill level. There's two, two skill levels. The ones that really can't jump and the ones that have a little bit of potential and they each have their days to be on the runway. And so that's how I divide that up. Too much information for young athletes. So when I decided I was going to really dive into learning this event, came here seven years in a row, you know, lots of information, reading Boobka, you know, whatever it took, watching videos on YouTube, tons and tons of stuff. So I came up with this really elaborate program, right? Drove the kids nuts, right? I had all these steps that I made them go through before they could ever get on the runway. And kids would give up. They'd walk away because it was just too dang much to consume. So lesson learned there, I've, I've softened and I've simplified and I make, I, my program's really simple for everybody now. Um, and it still seems to work fairly well. Skill levels, speed, age, you know, our skills are all over the place when it's seventh grade through uh, 12th grade. I do tell the kids every time they come to the runway, this is a sprinting sport, right? When they say, how do I get better? I tell them you gotta get faster, right? Because I have kids that literally walk down the runway. And you could say, why do I coach those kids? Because of their faces, right? They get on a pole, they jump in the pit, and they come out, they're just the happiest thing ever. And if they make six feet, fantastic, right? And it's, it's fun for me. It's also challenging to try to get a kid with no athletic skills at all to jump over a crossbar. And that can improve, I think it can improve your skill as a coach to try to make them do what they need to do to get over that crossbar. Um, hours spent, I mentioned that a little bit already. Try meets, so for me, there's three meets that matter. Big Nine Conference Championship, section meet, state meet. The rest of them, it's just practice. That's where we, that's where we try stuff that we haven't tried before. By the time we get to Big Nine, I hope that all the things that we experimented with will pay off for us. But that's the, that's the intent for the whole season. A uh, little story about pole progression and Minnetonka. Minnetonka just sticks in my brain and it still makes me quiver a little bit. So it was boys and girls running pole vaulting at the same time in opposite directions. So I had my boys going against the wind, girls going with the wind. And um, my son was going for a 10-6 attempt, I think, and he had just made a pole change. And because he was running into the wind, he went up, and he was very good at finishing his jump, curled over, came down, and he just made the bottom of the tongue of the pit 
upside down on his shoulders. So that was scary as hell. Then, on the other side, Andy Jacobs goes whipping in with a, a new pole chain. She goes up and lands in the bun off on the side. And I'm like, huh? Ah. So very frustrating day. However, I got with Steve White shortly after that. Steve White spent an hour and a half with me, training me on pole progression, how to pick the poles, how to pick the grip, how to move through all this stuff. And it, it's, it's become kind of a science for me in my head. Just And I'll go over a chart, one of his, his next pole uh, chart, if you haven't seen it. It's, it's the thing that I live by for my athletes. Uh, Matt had mentioned staying on the same brand of poles. I do not, I'm on every pole you can imagine. My shed is full of Altius, Essex, Pacer, just, I'm all over the map. So I do rent, I rent every year, all the way through the year. I usually make two or three rentals up front, and then as kids progress throughout the season, I make changes to the poles and I just swap them out. So I do, I do use rentals a lot. I do borrow poles a lot too. Um, Pole selection, and this is this one's most recent. State meet. Nathan Nelson was on a 14 foot seven, 170, and he had probably three inches of grip to go up on the pole. He goes over 15 feet, and you'll see the video. He goes over 15 feet by a lot, and I was like, 15 foot pole. We got a tailwind. This is the time to change, right? Eh, wrong choice. Um, so he finished on that 15 and didn't make another crossbar, which was unfortunate. But, um, but I was sort of wound up and excited that he made the 15. So um, uh, standards. <laughs> Pay attention to standards. It really, it really can matter. So I was at a, a pretty sizable meet. Andy Jacob was jumping, my son Hayden was uh, my assistant coach that season, and we were jumping, Andy was having some awkward crossbar things happening to her. And my son happened to go over off in the bleachers, and he just sat in the bleachers, and he was watching from another angle, and he came over and said, Dad, the standards are at least six inches off. So whatever 24 was, one of them was at 28, right? So now we're adjusting the standards based on the angle of the, the crossbar. So we had one standard at 19 and one at you know, 25 or something like that. So that, that was a really weird thing. But it, you know, that can happen. Headwinds. I hate headwinds. We all should hate headwinds, right? If, and I've gotten to the point now where if I get to a meet and there's headwinds and it's just a, you know, a junior in high school that has a clipboard, they ain't gonna know any better. Right, so I grab all the athletes and that pit's moving right now. I don't allow jumpers to jump into a headwind. I just can't bring myself to do it. Although we did kind of jump in a section meet into a headwind, which really pissed me off. <laughs> um, no time for off-season training. There's a lot of kids that come to me and they're like, I want off-season off off training. I really want to get into this, and they get so excited by the end of the vaulting season, and I give them all the instructions they need to get to get that off-season training, and they don't they don't go because they're vacationing, they're doing gymnastics, or whatever the case may be. Um, so that's more on the athlete than it is on me. Um, no indoor vaulting. That's just for me. That's just a a pain in the butt because I did build a 115 foot indoor runway that sits underneath the stadium that century because there were times when we thought we were going to have opportunities to use that and it ended up not working out. Uh, <laughs> some of the emotions that you have to deal with, you know, a kid misses the crossbar two times and all of a sudden they're in complete panic mode, right? So your job as a coach now is to try to bring them back down you know, get them settled so they can have that third attempt and make that third attempt. State meet, Nathan Nelson, 13 feet. He missed it twice. <laughs> you know, now what do you do? <laughs> it's like, I, it's hard to say, what do you say to a kid who's an elite athlete like that, jumping like he does and we're struggling at, at a low bar? It, it just, 
mind-boggling. Um, very quickly, a midmark is something that John taught me, but I don't think I ever really understood it until probably the third season after I saw it the first time. I do use it now for people like, um, like Nathan. I use it just to let myself know. It, we, put a, we put a cone at six steps out, and it just gives me an option to say, hey, if he was on there and he's on here, things are really working well. But if he's off there, he's going to be off here. Um, Nathan's pretty consistent, so if he is off, it's usually only a couple of inches, which really isn't going to matter um, in, a, in a jump. Uh, our tape for my poles, I do on the tape, I do mark with a Sharpie every six inches on the tape, and the tape is probably taped down to probably six inches below the ring, the little tape ring that says that's the end of the grip. I do that, and then uh, what I do it? I had it. Wait, wait, oh, that's right. I put it on here. All right. So hair ties. I love hair ties, right? No more thinking about where the kid needs to put their grip. So you'll see hair ties on every single one of my poles. Every pole has hair ties, all different colors, whatever the kids feel like they need to have on their pole. So I bring in a psychedelic pack of them and let the kids do what they want. But this works for me to say, I don't have to ask the kid where his hand grip goes, and it helps the athlete to know where they can't go. Right? I do have athletes that like to go like this before they run through and slide it up on me. And it's just annoying because they don't think, they think they need to go up higher in their grip and they, they want to move quicker than I'm willing to let them. So I'll see them in the back pushing it up and I catch them and I'm like, nope, bring it up here and I push it back down for them. But these are great. It's a great way to take away the thought from yourself as a coach. What was that grip the last time? What, you know? Where do I want to put your hand? We do have a safe grip concept where we say your safe grip is reach up as high as you can on the pole, and then that's your bottom hand for doing our two steps and four steps. Uh, flex. Thanks, Matt, for bringing that one up in yours. I added that in here. So all I know about flex is 0 .0 and 0 .9. That's it. I look at a pole and I say 0 .0, stiff. 0 .9, not so stiff. What I really look at is if I'm at a, a, a 170 pound pole and I'm gonna go to a 175 pound pole, let's say they're both 14 foot poles, I don't wanna go from a, from a um, 0.9 to a 0 0.0. Cause I know that, that that 175 is not only a bigger pole, but it's also a lot stiffer than that one that they just came off of. I think I said that right. I like to go 0 0.9 to 0 0.9, 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. It, it just depends on the athlete. But from all of the experience that I've had, when you get it, it's amazing how much that flex can differ in a kid's ball. And I've had I've had Nathan where he literally goes from a a 0.9 to a <coughs> 0.5 to a 0, 0.0 and they're all the same length and the results are they speak for themselves they really do and it, and when kids start jumping on 14 6 poles 15 foot poles it gets pretty scary even for the coach let's see like I said all brands a lot of my girls are gymnastic girls so that helps a lot um, I do have pole inventory for the entire city of Rochester, so I know which school has what poles and who I can borrow from, and that's been very helpful. I already talked about mixed up. Um, we do use uh, six steps for six foot crossbar, eight steps for eight foot crossbar, 10 steps for 10 foot crossbar, and so on. So you won't see, you won't see an athlete of mine who's jumping a six foot bar at a meet running from 14 steps. Um, I don't, I personally don't see the value in that and, and the step works, the step does work. Um, Andy was running 12 steps at state when she broke the record as a freshman at 13 feet. So that's a pretty powerful run to make that kind of height. 
Um, I, like I said, I, I like to believe that I'm very good at the vertical positioning. You'll see that in the videos that I brought along. One of the things that does help the kids, we do a lot of planking. They literally just swing up and plank and hold their body against the pole. The other thing that helps a lot is I take the four by eight trailers that we all run around with our uh, hurdles on, throw all the hurdles off, put a pad on that, take the pole, stick the pole in a building, and then sit on the trailer and then go through the whole top motion with wheels, right? It simplifies, it takes the plant and the bend and everything out of the picture. You just sit on it, the kids get, once you get them comfortable with getting in that position, they literally pull themselves up time, they rotate, and then they push off just like they're pushing up the same action as you're doing on top. Now, translate that to the runway and the bend, not quite as easy. But it does help get in their head that this is how the flow needs to be with your body when you're going up through that process. Okay, so I do depend on the, the top athletes who choose to go and get off-season training. My goal is to make damn sure that when they come back from Flagles, that they don't go downhill. <coughs> I don't want to be an impact or impede their ability to continue. So whatever information that Matt and Esther give me at the end of that season and coming into my season, picking up that athlete, I take that forward and hope to God they do better than what they did coming out of their off season training. Because we're going from indoor meets, right? Now we're going into the outdoor season and you know, you hope that somebody does better coming into an outdoor season. And, and Nathan's been phenomenal that way. He's always had great outdoor seasons after his indoor seasons. Uh, little, just some highlights of my program. Uh, I do, like I said, I manage the number of athletes. It is working the way I've got it set up now. Uh, we do count all of our steps. We do a lot from two steps, a lot from four steps, and a lot, a lot of stuff from six steps with all the different skill levels. Uh, the beginners, we talk a lot about having a straight top arm, talk a lot about having a good strong drive knee. We'll, we're gonna see some of the weak drive knees in the videos. Um, I don't with the, with the uh, we have a, a step count, which is one, two, three, plant two, three, because it starts out at the six, six step so as they're approaching the box it's one two three plant two three and what we really like to see happen with the beginners is that when they hit the the word plant that they're they're getting their arms up at the word plant so they're, they're that motion is happening on the word plant some kids don't like that count so they change whatever plant whatever it means to them they'll change that to something that makes more sense to them um, I don't talk a lot about with the young kids how to lower the pole. So in that one, two, three, plant, two, three, there's obviously some advanced pieces to that, but um, six steps out, one, two, three is where we kind of start to move our arm forward as we're bringing the pole down. There's this motion like this that's happening. And the young kids, it's more like, <laughs> they might get two steps into their six steps and then they're running with the pole like this. So we do, so we talk more about getting to that, that plant step and then pushing up than we do talk getting them confused about how to move their arms together like that. Now, when we get into the advanced jumpers, we start to talk a lot about how you're running with the pole and positioning the pole and John is smiling at me because he gets on my athletes a lot with that kind of information. Uh, advanced, we do a lot, um, a lot with eight steps. A lot of jumping from eight steps. Um, Nathan is making 13 feet from eight, eight steps right now. So that's a great practice, great practice uh, setup. We talk a lot about being tall on the plant. So when you're coming into the box, you're up in your body and your posture, everything's tall and straight. Um, sprint mechanics. I wanna say one thing about sprint mechanics because when Andy Jacobs was a freshman, and John remembers how she ran as a freshman, right? She leaned forward with the pole. <laughs> it was just like gun went off and she was like bent over and just charging that box like an animal. So 
John got on her, said, hey, we're going we're gonna to correct this, the sprint mechanics. I knew nothing about sprint mechanics. So we spent, I track it at 18 months doing sprint mechanic training to get her to straighten up and run tall. And you know how hard it was. It took, it was a lot. And my head was like exploding after every practice for the first five practices, I think, because it just, it just didn't make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, thank God for him because he de definitely got her to, to get that and she would end up running from a 16 step run and managing all those steps. And so yeah, it worked out really good. Um, we do do some sand pit training. It does help with the timing of your arms planting into sand instead of planting into a box. Sand pit training is usually just straight pulling. but. But we'll get kids to get their timing right, and then we'll get them to try to creep up the pole so that they're always trying to drive over vertical. So they stand the pole up and get past that without falling backwards. And so it does, you just want them to push, 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 and jump, jump and push, and just keep trying to creep your hand up as high as you can, but still keep that pole rolling over vertical. Kids don't like sand pits. <laughs> They just don't like it, but it does help if, they, if they're willing to, to work at it. I talked a little bit about the vertical planking. Um, timing of the turn, it just, it just kills me. Oh, yes. Uh, honestly, it depends on the athlete. athlete. And, and I'll show you one that's just coming up and coming athlete. And, and it, it very much, somebody who really shouldn't be pole vaulting, I don't care to put them in a sand pit. It just doesn't make sense. But um, turning. So uh, a lot of young athletes, even when they're doing 14 feet, 15 feet, you'll watch, right? They'll swing up. They get up there. They ride the bend up. They put their legs over the crossbar and then they turn right and how much height do you lose doing that probably six to ten inches when you wait that long to turn so literally for me it's it's an absolute mission to get that kid to start that rotation as they're going up as a missile they get that rotation at least enough so the hips they get enough space with their hips so they can put a cup at the top right and if they turn a little too late, their hips are going to just touch the crossbar. But if I can get them just past that a little bit and they cup, they'll just miss the crossbar as long as I get the standards in the right position. And so we, we do talk a lot about, we have a lot of video and talk about, you know, this is what you need to do. But it's so hard to translate that with that kind of speed, right? You have a very short window of time to make all this stuff happen. Um, and then, like I said, we do talk a lot more about lowering the pole. Um, I always promote year-round training because that's how we get our best athletes. Honestly, if you're gonna, if you want to be a top-notch pole vaulter, you really need to be. You really need the reps. You really need that off-season training. I do use community education to bring in other schools, um, which has been very helpful, and the district has been very good about allowing me to do that. I do practice on summers. Summer practices are usually um, every Tuesday night at about four o'clock. And I usually have three to four athletes that show up for summer practices. Even though the list of I will be there is about 10 or 15, only a couple show up. All right, so let's look at some videos. How am I doing on Okay, that's an eighth grade girl, just started this year. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit about her progress. She comes into the box here, and what I look for is that position right there. So I'm looking for her knee to be up much higher here. 
You can see it's down a little bit. She does have a nice straight leg here. She's got good positioning between the top hand and her back heel and has a little bit of an arch here. And then as she goes in, you can see that she kind of tossed her hips forward and she got her head ahead of the pole. She's not quite strong enough for it yet, but we really try to keep the head behind the pole if we can. If the athlete's strong enough, we want that head behind the pole and you'll see that in another, uh, another piece. She does a pretty good job of keeping her trail leg straight. And that's about as good as she can do on the top end. And she's making six feet and she's having a blast. However, little story there. Dad comes up to me in the middle of a meet, while, literally while I'm coaching, with his cell phone, and he's like, you know, we've been watching all these videos, we've watched all these Olympic jumpers, and he's going on and on and on, and he's like, how does a kid get to that level? And I'm like, wow, <laughs> what do I do with that question? I, all I could say was, you know, first of all, I'm kind of in the middle of something here, and I said, second of all, that takes years right not months but years for kids to, to develop into that she's a she this girl's a real hoot to coach though really fun she looks tall how tall she, is she she's about my height so she for a eighth yeah. grader she's tall she has some potential we'll see how her athleticism works out okay this will probably be the next superstar this is an eighth grader okay Looking for the same thing. This is his fourth time on the runway. So we're looking for a good, same, same kind of positioning. He's got a pretty decent drive knee there. He pushes it up. Getting that, getting a good position there. He's got a pretty good swing. He's got the pendulum coming, right? The nice straight trail leg coming through. And he's working on planking. Not where the position we want in the plank, but he's, I mean, this is an eighth grader, right? And he's, he made, uh, almost made nine feet at Big Nine Championship. So uh, he came, he was a late comer, but boy, he uh, picked it up fast. He did do a lot of gymnastics as a, as a younger, well, seven, sixth, seventh, fifth grade or whatever. Apparently he was really good at gymnastics and it did, it did help him with some of the positioning, because he, eighth grader comes up to me, hey, I know body positioning. I'm like, that's great. You're gonna need to know that. I was like, what kid comes up and tells you I know how to position my body? <laughs> so he, he's been a lot of fun. Okay, let's take a look at Ryan. All right, now this, this is Ryan. He is going to be a senior. Um, and he loves, loves pole vaulting, right? Loves pole vaulting. <clears throat> He's going to be a senior. That is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he knows what he has to do. Comes out of the pit every time like this. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> so uh, he just loves it. He's gonna, he's gonna make. He might make nine, nine six this season as a senior. He might have enough strength to get there. But he's at about eight, uh, attempting eight six. But so much fun. His family's into honey. I get a jar of honey every season. That's all. That's just fantastic. I love honey. Okay, and here's my girl rock star, Maddie Haberstad. She made it to state this year. And this would be, okay, now, <laughs> watch her hips here. So if you see this, We've got no drive leg. It's actually amazing how well she can jump with some of the stuff that she does. But looking at both legs, ack, right? 
um, she'll, she throws her hips ahead of everything as she's coming in. And honestly, she's a long jumper, right? So the long jumping is showing up on the pole vault runway. We didn't really identify it or pick it out like that until last season, because she was the one that mentioned it. I said, how can we get you to stop doing that? And she's like, well, I'm a long, I'm a long jumper. That's what I do in the long jump. And I was like, but you don't do it here. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time trying to make this go away. Um, here's what she gets right. Right, we want that right there. If I can get that out of every athlete, I'm a super happy guy. Now she's turning away a little bit here because the pole is a little bit soft. But, where's name two? All right. So, question would be, can she do it right? She can do it right. She just refuses to do it right when, her, when she's at her 12 foot, 12 step run on a bigger pole. But she can get there. And I'm hoping she'll get really close to that on a regular basis. Again, she has the nice vertical there. So here's Maddie. This is Maddie at state. <laughs> One thing she has is she has this really pretty large last two steps. And so this season we will be working on her approach to the box quite a bit. Again, so now we're on. The thing about, the thing about her is last season she jumped on a 12 foot 115 until sections. At sections she went from a 12 foot 115 to a 12 foot 135. I was dumbfounded. And I don't know exactly what it was she was doing differently, but she was able to make that change. And then at state here, this is the 12 foot 135 that she started to make work. I had a 12 foot 140 in my hands for her to jump on, but I just wasn't trusting her penetration you can see she's she's really making that pole work. Um, so pole choices, Essex versus Pacer. I love Essex for her. I absolutely love the way Essex behave for her and probably for quite a few women vaulters, but I just love how they work for her. Uh, boys on the other hand, I would want, if I have them, UC, UCS Spirits. Absolutely best pole in my head to be on because I've seen the success that they bring. If I can't get those, I'm on Pacer FX. And that's what you'll see Nathan jumping on this upcoming season. He'll primarily be on Pacer FX. Um, Can you explain a little more why those are your preferred poles? What's that? Could you explain more why those are your preferred poles and why you prefer one for your girl, girls versus your boys? Okay, here's the way I like to explain it. John, you can help me out on this one a little bit if I don't get it quite right. So, Essex, the way I talk about Essex, soft in, soft out, right? You bend the pole in, it bends in slow, it's a slow ride. As the athlete, you gotta know how to load yourself into that bend, and then you gotta give it the time to push you up. So, very important for you to get vertical and stay vertical so that you can wait for that pole to react for you. Um, of course, if they get big enough like this, she's 118 pounds and she's on 135 pound pole. So she's going to get a little bit faster response from it. So that's what I like about that. That's why I like that. They work really well. Andy, on the other hand, she was on U USC Spirits early. Those I like to describe as hard in, hard out, right? You're coming in and you've got to be an athlete to move these poles. But if you do move them, the throw that they give back to you cannot be beat. They are gonna to toss you 
like a madman. Pacer, I, I feel like I get just about the same, the same results as the UCS Spirits. I mean, but yeah. So anyway, that's Maddie. I'm hoping for an 11, six or 12 foot jump out of her this season. All right, so this is the mistake I told you about. This is Nathan at State. This year, this is a 15 foot jump. Now, it ain't pretty, really. <laughs> I mean, there's things he could do better here. And if he wants to get on, you know, 15, 15, 6 pole, I think he's probably going to need to make some improvements here. Um, however, you know, when, I, when he came on the runway as a 7th grader, I was like, this kid's never going to fall. And he is a prime example of if you want to do something, holy cow. I mean, he hit the gym, he ate the foods, he ate everything everybody was telling him. And, yeah, his parents are like, we have no idea what happened here. <laughs> but, uh, Is that pole from Northfield? Yes. As I mentioned, <laughs> Carl's been very kind about giving me his uh, he's pacer got some, He's got some big sticks. Yep. Um, this is a 14-6... 175, I believe, and he's about 150 some pounds. So he's got some wicked speed. He gets pretty vertical. He starts his, his rotation for me. His rotation has started at the point that I would like to see it started. Because you, you can see here's the crossbar, the angle from here isn't the best, but. His hips are moving in the direction that I would like to see them moving in because he's not that close to the crossbar based on the angle here. And so he's going up. And this is a 15 foot crossbar. I think he's got some clearance here. So why would I change poles? <laughs> but I did. After this jump, I went to the 15 foot pole. And it didn't load very well for him. But you can see his on this jump, his standards were at 30. If I can, the farther back I can have them, the better when they're jumping like this. And so his standards at were 30. So my math was standards at 30, great jump, 15 foot pole. It's got to work, right? And it didn't. So if I see this in a video this season, that pole change ain't happening. We're going to just stick with it. And he still had grip on that pole, too. He had about four inches of grip on that pole. So. I had, I had room to work. I think I made a poor choice, but uh, we'll correct that this season. Thank God we have a second, a uh, no, last season with him. Okay, then lastly, this is Andy Jacobs. Um, why is it not moving? Andy was preparing for the La Crosse River Vault this past summer. There we go. And one thing that she was doing, as you can see, this is a great Right, this is what we're trying to strive for, right? Getting nice, nice drive knee here. Nice arch in the back right there. One thing that she was doing when she first started out, 
practicing is when she would plant, she was rolling her wrists out on the plant. And that seemed to be taking something away from it. And so I had her turn her wrists under coming into the plant. And that immediately changed a little bit of the way she was penetrating. Um, the next thing that she was working on is in her college years, and I don't, I don't know, it's really weird. I don't know how she ended up like this, but this leg right here, I don't have a video of it, but this leg right here, she would swing it up and she'd swing it way up over here, way, just way past her head, and then she would throw it at the crossbar. Very awkward thing to look at as a coach. So what we did is we got, we started to talk about that and I said, why don't you try to just bring that back to the pole and then try to push your, take your hips and follow your hips behind your leg, but make, make those go up the pole instead of throwing your leg way behind your head. And so this was an example of her making that adjustment for herself. So you can see the leg stays, the leg is now staying back by the pole. And she's getting herself vertical. And this is a super soft pull from an eight step. That was her, that was her thing to work on, was to get that leg under control. And then just a little thing about turning her wrists under and getting a little bit more power into the pole on her takeoff. Okay. All right, pole progression. So, I live and die by this. I absolutely love this chart. Um, I had a coach sent me a text message last season, and he said, Ray, I just made my son crap himself. So well, what did you do? He said, well, I didn't have much of a pole selection, so I just grabbed the next biggest pole in the shed. And his son was on a uh, um, uh, 14 foot 175 or 14 foot 180, something like that. But we'll start with the 14 175. So he was down here at 14 175. And he says, I grabbed the next, the next best pole that I thought would work. So I went to, a, <laughs> I went to a 15 foot 170 and sent him down the runway from his full run. You know, really enough said about where the kid ended up and it scared the bejesus out of both of them because he did not really make much of the pit on that attempt. So I took him through this and said, look, you had him at a 14,175. I know the kid, I know his body language, I know what he, how his progression is, I know what his penetration is. So I could say, look, get him on the 14,180 and see if you can at least move him back out of the pit, right? Because he was definitely coming up underneath the crossbar. And I said, and then if you get him working well on the 14180 and we need grip, let's move him to the 146170 for that extra grip. If, you know, if, if he's not gonna, if grip is not gonna help him, but he still needs, needs to come out a little bit further out of the pit, then we go to the 85 and work our way from there. But yeah, to go, to, to go all the way over from this side of the chart to that chart in one jump is <laughs> insanity. And he, he knows it, he didn't know better because he, he did, not, uh, did not have a whole lot to do with pole uh, selection. But um, you know, Nathan Nelson will be on, probably starting on a 14.6175 pacer with me this spring, and we will have a 14.6180 next to that, and then I will probably carry a 15.170 next to that, and that'll be my three poles. Okay, so what's your rule of thumb for switching like handle when you're switching to the shoulder or a smaller pole? Do you, you know, if I'm grabbing two hands down on the 14, do you want to do a 14.6? You know, what's your, do you have kind of a rule of thumb on that? Yep, That's kind yep. Of I, struggle with I sure do. You know, coming under or, or being out there or approaching. You know, 
So if you're two grips down from the top and you're going to go to a longer pole, my first question is why are you going to a longer pole? Okay. That being said, when I change poles, whether it's a longer pole or the next pole, I'm down one grip. Automatically one grip down, not up. I want to see what the performance of the kid and the pole is with them being one grip down. Um, you can get in a lot of trouble, and I saw it with Andy Jacobs where, you know, take her from a grip, next pole, bump her hand up just a little bit on that pole, and it, it, it never seems to work that well. But if you build some confidence, you get them to take that one grip down, and they end up in the pit, oh man, you know, all bets are off now because the kid has the confidence now and they know that that pole is going to get a little bit softer as they go up the pole and get into the sweet spot. You don't want to spend a whole lot of time in that, that low grip space with, with good athletes, right? You want them topping the pole off if you can get them there. But I can tell you, coaching a kid on a 15 foot pole just scares the bejesus out of me. And how do you get a kid's grip up to that 15 foot grip and make them hang on there? It's just, it's, it's scary because you got to move, you got to move a lot of fiberglass when you get up to that kind of pole. And I have to deal with it this whole season. <laughs> and I can tell you my anxieties are high already and we're not even at the season yet. Now, the one thing I'm going to do this season that I haven't done in the past is I'll be renting my poles two weeks before the season even starts because two weeks into the season we go to River Falls and we're jumping indoors, right? but he's coming out of his indoor season, going right into an indoor meet, and I wanna make sure that he has all the tools that he needs to perform well at that first meet. Let's see, last thing. Yes, I do rent poles. Um, the school and has just been very good about it. But like I said, the one thing that I like about pole renting is when I'm making pull decisions based on that chart that I showed you, you know, a simple call to Steve or to the Flagels, hey, I need the next poll. Parents are great, right? Hey, go fetch your kids' polls. And parents are on the road immediately to make that happen for me. And one thing I started eight years ago, maybe, is, um, I decided to buy a state hat every state meet and then have the hat embroidered with the kids' uh, PRs on the sides. Started quite a while ago, so probably four years into it now, the kids got, they figured it out, they were excited about it, so now it was all about getting a hat and getting their name on the hat, which it's really turned out to be kind of a fun a fun thing for us. And, and so yeah, so. I'm kind of bummed at the quality of the hat. This is my favorite hat that the state ever put out, but the quality of them has gone down a little bit. <laughs> I'd like to see a nicer hat like the ones they had back then. Those were cool. And this one in particular, my son as a junior signed up for the Army, so I kept the Army pin on the hat for that season. So, All right, that's all I have. If there's my cell phone number and the email are on the, the top chart. Um, if you have questions for me, I'm willing to share, willing to help. I do like going to other people's sites to help, more so than trying to get people to come to me, because um, that seems to work pretty well with the kids being comfortable with their own poles and their own pits and things like that. So, yeah, that's what I have. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you.